Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the to today's Wednesday seminar. We've had uh, several seminars before covering the subject of belted road, but this is something which perhaps is is going to be different. It's clear because it talks about being from the ground up. It's actually a worm's eye view, as it were, almost, if you may permit me to the expression, from the road, as it were, from the actual road and the belt. So I, 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 I it would be. It, even hearing of it, I was excited by interest and I think it's, I'm sure that it will be very interesting to see what the reality is as you proceed from one, it's almost like a, a kind of a, a take carrying a, a, a YouTube kind of a journey, if I <laughs> may, be, uh, may be permitted to use that language. Uh, and no better person to deal with it than uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Jacob Bardell. Uh, Call you professor no, because no, no, been, no. we are working no, with you. Not, not a professor. Not a professor. <laughs> so far off that. Uh, he's a he is he's once and future uh, alumnus of the Mercator Institute of China Studies, huh? and uh, in Berlin, and a person who's collected a lot of data uh, and has been a Belt and Road tracker in an in an almost literal sense, if I may be permitted to say. I don't want to come between you and the speaker. By making any general comments, I think uh, it's better that we straight away start with the uh, 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 the the view of the belt and road from the ground up. Thank Over you. to you, uh, Mr. Mandel. Thank you for that introduction, and um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to ICS for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'm a little bit nervous talking to such uh, distinguished China watchers about China and the Belt and Road, so I don't presume to tell you anything about the BRI, uh, but I'd at least like to start by sharing my interpretation of it, because I think there are multiple interpretations which are uh, possible, and just so we're on the same page, um, I'd like to introduce my take on it. Um, so, but first a little background about what I've been doing. So I started in March 2019 traveling um, the Belt and Road, through Belt and Road countries. I'll look at the, the route in a second. Uh, prior to that, um, I was working at uh, MacArthur Institute of China Studies uh, in Berlin on this uh, BRI tracking exercise they do. So they have a database which just lists uh, BRI projects and then they try and do mapping exercises on top of that. <coughs> Uh, which is obviously a really good um, gig for someone who's interested in the BRI. Um, but I sort of began becoming frustrated with uh, my lack of uh, understanding of the context. So I wouldn't found it difficult to relate to projects in Tajikistan without knowing anything about Tajikistan, for example. Um, so this sort of prompted a desire to go out and see and try and understand these countries uh, a little bit more. Um, which I now think has sort of developed into um, this frustration has developed into this philosophy that I think China's global policy uh, necessitates an understanding of the globe. Um, also, I wanted I, I thought there was a little bit of a lack of an on the ground perspective when it came to BRI stuff. There's lots of sort of op eds, huge amounts of literature written about it, but uh, not so much. There is some good s stuff, but not as much reporting from the ground. Um, so yeah, this is an independent project. So I was freelancing for Merix um, to sort of finance it and some others, Berlin Policy Journal, and doing some other freelance writing, but it's independent. And thus, uh, it wasn't very analytically driven, to be honest. I didn't go with research questions other than what does it look like? I saw it more as a sort of mission to educate myself about these different countries and try and at least get a background on the, the countries and the, what the BRI is doing there. Um, so, just a quick overview. Okay. Yeah. So this is the route. Um, so the idea was to go from London slash Brussels slash Berlin to Singapore, um, and then back again by sea. So roughly along the Silk Road economic belt through the continent, through Central Asia, and so on, and then sort of follow some maritime Silk Road countries through Southeast Asia, and then um, back through Indian Ocean in East Africa to Europe, uh, but I was I got to Hanoi and I spent six weeks in Hanoi, and then this uh, coronavirus um, mm. outbreak happened and it became a little bit difficult. People were cancelling meetings and I just imagined that sort of doing lots of land borders and 
traveling extensively in Southeast Asia. I was expecting it to get worse in Southeast Asia first rather than sort of Italy or the UK. But anyway, so I decided to fulfill a lifelong ambition of coming to India <laughs> and switch my focus to South Asia without much research. Um, so this has been a bit of a, even more of a crash course than the whole thing. Uh, so I've recently been to Bangladesh and uh, I was in Calcutta and I just arrived in Delhi uh, last night. Um, so I'm going to look at the actual ground up stuff, but first I want to try and quickly as possible um, talk about the BRI, just like I said, give my take on it. Um, so I think this question is a pretty fundamental semantic and taxonomic problem in that what it means and what it applies to isn't really very straightforward. Um, and I always ask this question, uh, what is the BRI? And I get different responses. As we're talking about, it's quite hard to pin down. Um, um, so by now we know that it's quite a, quite a vague, vague thing and I won't go into uh, detail of why that is, but you know, if we look top down, uh, the policy documents, or if we sort of try and attempt a bottom up uh, vision by linking uniting factors between projects, uh, whichever way we look at it, we don't get much clarity. There's no list of BRI projects, there's no um, committees sort of sanctioning BRI products, um, so it's difficult to kind of define what the BRI is. Um, I've seen it compared to a brand. Um, which I think is interesting, but I think it's actually more uh, vague than even a brand because at least with a brand, say Coca-Cola, you've got headquarters like defining what Coca-Cola applies to and then it's protected by trademark um, laws and such, but uh, there's no such uh, process with the BRI. So if we're going to continue the Coca-Cola analogy, I think it's more like cola and sort of a flavor of development which is associated with the Chinese dream and things. Um, so this is just a slide. I took this picture in um, Korgos in the Kazakh Chinese border um, and this is a Kazakh project product I think apparently using German technology. It's powdered camel milk uh, which is uh, branded with a one belt one road label but I don't know whether it's financed by Exim Bank of China or anything but I, I doubt it. Um, so I look to um, official sources, state media, and what Chinese officials call BRI, um, and first off, and luckily that's quite broad because obviously projects, state-owned enterprises, have um, political incentive to associate their projects with the BRI, so it's quite easy to identify BRI projects in that sense. And then what I like to do is sort of look at what I consider the policy goals, um, and there are probably many more than this and a lot of these overlap and they all have sort of pre-2013 origins but I just came up with 10 which uh, the BRI sort of ties together I think so I just run through them quickly um, so yeah creating new sources of growth in this sort of period of new normal um, increasing um, and making Chinese companies more globally competitive sort of adding easy projects to uh, the portfolios of Chinese um, champions like uh, China Road and Bridge Corporation, which I probably talk about a lot, um, and then exporting or at least entertaining existing capacity. For example, we see that with uh, coal coal plant building; they can't build them in China, so they look for projects overseas, and then just generally promoting Chinese regulations, standards, equipment. Um, uh, what else? Winning friends and influence, especially in places like Southeast Europe where they didn't have much of a footprint before. Um, I've put renminbi internationalization in there. Uh, I don't know much about it to be honest, but I know they're keen to denominate loans in renminbi when they can. Uh, and then of course strategic concerns like uh, things like Straits of Malacca feature in there. And then lastly the sort of soft power elements of promoting a positive image of Chinese development and finance. Um, so yeah, this is all pre-2013, and I'm sure, as you know, lots of these projects are as well. They existed uh, long before and were incorporated into this BRI um, umbrella, long before Xi Jinping stood at this lectern and uh, sort of announced the BRI. Um, that's this lectern, by the way. Um, 
So, which begs the question, what, what's new and what changes about the BRI? Um, and so, essentially, I see the BRI as just an expression of Chinese vision. It comes at a particular historical moment as this articulation of global ambition. Um, and it's associated with foreign policy concepts like community of common destiny. Um, and so, to a certain extent, obviously, China already had a vision for what it wanted the world to look like, but I think it hadn't shared it properly and it didn't have a name. And when you name something, you're introducing it to the world and you're also staking a claim. Uh, so that's the external effects. And then domestically, by naming something, you galvanize the sort of state machinery. And in that sense, it's also a campaign slogan. Um, and you can see this in how vague it is. You have the direction set from the top and the detail filled in later. And there's also a process of negotiation evident in this vagueness too. Um, so anyway, that's my um, introduction to BRI. So I'll get on to uh, where I was going now, starting. So I'm going to look at Southeast Europe and Central Asia, just as two different regions. Um, I'll just go over what I saw going on in those countries and just offer a few disparate takeaways. Um, so. I've heard Southeast Europe, this uh, the Western Balkan Six, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, and North Macedonia referred to as a sort of EU backyard, but it's actually more like an EU in a courtyard if you look at the countries surrounding it. They're all EU. This is a strategically important place. And um, there's been a lot of fuss in the media and in Brussels over the last couple of years about external influence in this region. So we're talking about Russia, uh, Turkey, Gulf states, but also um, a lot of stress on, on China. Um, and when I was in this region, I was surprised at how visible China was, actually. Sort of as a, um, in concrete terms, as a proportion of loans and FDI, it's not hugely significant, uh, but it's, it's noticeable. And I think this is one of the last regions in the world, perhaps, you know, along with sort of Central Eastern Europe and the, you know, with the 17 plus one grouping that China really started paying attention to. So in this sense, it's quite interesting. It sort of heralded China's emergence as a sort of fully global player. Um, and when we're talking about Southeast Europe, uh, I think we're largely talking about Serbia. Um, because it's really the only decent sized market and um, in, on the global scale of course it's not, not huge, only 7 million but it's bigger than the rest of the tiny neighbourhoods uh, outside Serbia you can count the projects China is involved in on one hand within Serbia there's a decent amount of infrastructure there's the Budapest Belgrade Railway, the Serbian side of it and there's quite a few highways, uh, proposed projects include an um, industrial park just outside the capital Belgrade uh, metro system they want to build. They're also funding some coal and supplying lots of equipment for coal plants. And um, last time I counted, uh, Exim Bank of China had provided 3.18 billion for transport and energy products uh, projects, but it's not clear how much of this has been dispersed. There's also a sizable uh, FDI. Um, the famous one in the top right is uh, uh, the Smedrovo steel plant. Uh, which her steel acquired um, after the US, U.S. steel sold it back to the government for sort of a token one dollar. Um, and all these pictures are uh, ones I've taken from uh, the trip, by the way, apart from the ones that aren't like the close-up of Xi Jinping's face. Um, so yeah, this project was inaugurated by Xi Jinping and it sort of quickly began turning a profit and it's sort of held as a poster child of Sino-Serbian relations. There's also a first major greenfield investment in the region, a tyre factory that's estimated to be to cost uh, $900 million, will cost. Uh, there's also a copper mining and smelting complex, and then other smaller things like poultry processing. Um, outside of Serbia, <coughs> the footprint is smaller, but like I said, this is a tiny region. Uh, so Montenegro has a population of 700,000, uh, which I think is like central Delhi or something. And there's only one project here, um, but for the size of the country, it's a really big project. So this is China Road and Bridge Corporation. It's a nearly $1 billion road. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's big, especially when you um, bear in mind that it's a 41 kilometer section of highway. There's Smokovac to Matisevo section of this highway that they imagine connecting 
uh, the sort of southern port of Bar in Montenegro with the uh, northern border with Serbia and this is a 41 kilometer section it's very expensive that's the there's various controversies around it but the main one is it's just really really expensive um, and Bosnia Herzegovina um, there's a controversial coal plant is the main headline there are a few power projects but the only one that's gone anywhere is Tesla B uh, which has annoyed the EU uh, on paper, it's because uh, it contravenes uh, rules by the Energy Secretariat about financing coal, state financing of coal. Uh, so by providing a state guarantee, they say it's broken these rules. Uh, but it's also generally just seen as environmentally a uh, bad thing to do. Um, although local officials defended it by saying Germany did the same thing in terms of upgrading its coal technology. They need electricity, they have cheap lignite coal, so it's hard to argue with, I suppose. Um, then Macedonia. So here we have two Chinese roads built by Sino Hydro. Sino Hydro. Uh, they're long delayed. Um, one's built now, but they both have been long delayed, and uh, they're associated with corruption charges that help bring down the former government. Uh, so by now, you've probably noticed that lots of these projects are a little bit controversial. Um, so yeah, one's been completed. The one picture pictured is uh, still underway. And when I visited, it was abandoned, and there was this sort of weird camp of Sina Hydro workers. They'd been living there, and they had this hot pot bubbling, and they told me they hadn't been hadn't been working for a month, and no one really knows why it was so delayed. There are various reasons that I was given, but it looks like it's the company's fault. Um, and then lastly, Albania and Kosovo. So this is a fairly easy one. China doesn't recognize Kosovo, so there's not really a footprint there. Um, and there's a few potential projects in Albania. Obviously, um, Sino-Albanian relations used to be, they're interesting, uh, but now there's nothing significant underway. Uh, they were going to build a highway, the Arba Highway, but um, that fell through. And someone, a uh, former politician and academic, told me that was because of US pressure. I don't know whether that's true. There's only one person who said that. Um, so just some general observations. First, I think it's important to put the footprint into context. Uh, so it's significant and it's grown dramatically and likely to continue growing. But it is also worth bearing in mind um, that it's sort of of the larger whole. It's proportionally not very big. So I've just put a few facts there. I don't know whether you can read them, especially not from the back, but um, yeah, the Bank of Serbia's debt to all foreign governments, development banks, uh, is less than that which is owed to the European Investment Bank. Germany, Netherlands and Russia, they're all more important investors um, as of the end of 2018. And also 2017, China accounted for 0.37% of Serbian exports. So you see there are other players which are much more important, as you'd imagine, because it's quite far away from China. Um, the other thing to note that I was surprised by is how pro-China the region is as a whole, especially in Serbia. So the increasingly authoritarian uh, Alexander Vucic there, he goes to almost embarrassing lengths to uh, um, court um, Chinese officials. They talk about eternal still friendship. I heard the foreign minister say Serbia was a home away from home for China. Um, and as mentioned, uh, Beijing doesn't recognize Kosovo, which is uh, an incredibly emotive issue for Serbians, um, Kosovan independence, and it's something Serbians appreciate immensely. Even people, just everybody, not just officials, but someone you meet on the street when you talk about China, they talk about this. And I think the emotive basis for this relationship is quite symbolically and interestingly wrapped up in, in this place. So um, this is a on the site of a cultural center which China are building on the site of the former um, Chinese embassy um, which was destroyed accidentally if you believe Washington by uh, the US in the 1999 NATO bombing of Yugoslavia and this is a plaque to the martyred journalists, Chinese journalists who were killed there so this stuff is quite interesting I think um, so this pro-Beijing sentiment is less the case outside of Serbia, but I think it generally holds true. Bosnia, probably. The Montenegro highway is very divisive, but largely people blame the government, not China. I think Macedonia is having second thoughts, uh, but there's still general interest. Um, 
and there's lots of people to people stuff cultural outreach in the region and there's this big narrative going on which sort of sees China as a foil to the EU I think and more traditional sort of Western uh, powers uh, so people conceptualize the people say the EU is patronizing bossy and demanding uh, whereas China, China has this sort of image of a no-nonsense businessman. You know, they sort of say, we know they're out to make money and they're looking after their own interests, but at least they treat us with respect. And uh, this is also part of Beijing's own narrative, right? They're about non-interference and brotherly development. So it, I think it's working well in this region. Um, they're respected because they finance projects that local governments want to finance. For example, that highway I showed you, the World Bank said no to that coal projects, EIB isn't going to finance those of course, uh, so China steps up to the plate. And this is related to another observation I think, um, that China is a contingency plan for many governments in the region, but maybe also globally. Um, so in a, in a lot of cases I think they'd rather have EU finance and EU involvement, but where the EU is not willing, now they can go to Beijing, can go to poli Chinese policy banks for money. But likewise, I think the region is also a second choice for China. Um, so what I mean here is that I think a big factor in Chinese interest is the region's proximity to the EU. Um, so China Road and Bridge Corporation, for example, that massive project in Montenegro, uh, not only do they get a I impressive project to add to their portfolio, they also get to familiarize themselves with EU standards which are applied in, in Montenegro. Uh, but Unlike in the EU, they can tie loans to contracts. Uh, so they can't do this in the EU, as we saw when um, Hungary tried to give the Budapest-Belgrade railway uh, to a Chinese company without, um, without uh, tendering it. Uh, Brussels stepped in and sort of said, you can't do that. But they can do that in Montenegro. So it's a <coughs> sort of convenient mechanism. And uh, lastly, there's a lot of hand-wringing in Brussels about um, China threatening EU interests and EU integration and my sort of op-ed style headline on this that I go with is that the EU is the biggest threat to EU interests in the Western Balkans um, so I don't know whether this is obscure or sort of mainstream uh, political stuff but um, last autumn um, France vetoed talks with Albania and Mos Macedonia not sort of talks about talks about talks about eventually one day joining perhaps uh, and I was in Serbia at the time for a conference and there was just absolute apocalyptic anger and despair at this decision and everyone was just aghast and you really get the sense that people are sick of the EU in a lot of ways or being strung along and they also don't think, a lot of people don't think they have a good chance of joining the club anymore. So. Beijing doesn't offer an alternative to the EU, um, of course it doesn't, there's not, never going to be an economic union with China, uh, but it's an auxiliary option, especially when they don't think they're going to join this EU club, it's, um, it's an option. And integration I think is in Beijing's interests, they'd love it if Montenegro and Serbia join the EU, uh, especially with all the influence and projects they have in these countries. Uh, corruption is also something that people talk a lot about in Brussels, <coughs> but I think it's worth um, pointing out that <coughs> this is a local phenomenon, very much endemic, um, and it's not really a Chinese import. Uh, the same with the uh, dubious nature of a lot of these projects. Uh, these these were projects that were chosen at a local level, and some of them, you know, environmentally bad. <coughs> commercially viable, not sure, but at least they were local decisions. So um, this is a larger observation I have about Chinese finance as part of the BRI, is that I kind of see it as this amoral enhancement drug. It sort of brings out the best and the worst in countries, depending on oversight and local governance and things like that. Okay, so the next region uh, is Central Asia. Um, <coughs> So Central Asia is where I really felt China is a, a regional force. The projects become too numerous to list on one PowerPoint slide and as soon as I stepped off that ferry crossing the Caspian Sea I sort of felt like I'd arrived in Asia uh, rather than sort of crossing the Bosphorus in Istanbul or whatever it's supposed to be. 
Um, so I'm just going to break down the region again in terms of China and the BRI. Uh, again, apologies if uh, you know the region, but before I came, I sort of saw the stance blending into one a little bit. And um, but there is a big distinction between what China's doing in Uzbekistan and in Tajikistan, and obviously the economic and political situations are very different. So starting with Uzbekistan. Um, which is one of the more interesting countries, I think, in Central Asia in terms of China because it's received less attention than Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, since um, Karimov's death and beginning of reforms in 2016, Uzbekistan has really opened up, uh, made improved relations with its neighbors. Um, there's some debate between pessimists and optimists as to the quality and direction of reform, but generally there's a lot of new interest, uh, international interest in, in Uzbekistan, including from China. Um, but of course, because there's international interest, China has a lot of competition in Uzbekistan. And uh, again, although it's only two Delhi's worth of population, it's the biggest uh, Central Asian market uh, by far. Uh, so. There's um, a lot of investment in manufacturing here from China and special economic zones that are opening up, two or three. Um, there's only one really big infrastructure uh, project, the Angren Pop Railway, of which the Kanchik Tunnel is part. And this, I think, is the longest tunnel in, railway tunnel in Central Asia or maybe even wider region. Um, generally, people are more ambivalent and less concerned about China than in um, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan. Uh, but that makes sense because Uzbekistan uh, is further away, doesn't share a border. Uh, oh, and uh, I'm largely skipping Turkmenistan because I didn't go there, because I was denied a visa. Um, but it's worth mentioning that Turkmenistan is massively dependent on Chinese exports, especially gas. Uh, China's building a... Or that they built pre-BRI a pipeline from Uzbekistan. I think now there are three, the A, B and C, and China National Petroleum owns A and B, and part owns C, and they're planning on building D, uh, going a different route through Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, but that doesn't look like it's going anywhere soon. Uh, so Tajikistan is hugely dependent on China. Um, there's investment in cotton, cement, lots of other manufacturing, uh, resource extraction, so coal, um, gold. Uh, there's also infrastructure being built. Uh, China's been building roads in Tajikistan for quite a long time, definitely pre Belt and Road. Um, there's a power plant in power plant in the capital Dushanbe. There's transmission lines. Um, there's also reported interest in the southern border of Tajikistan. Uh, with Afghanistan. Um, when, I, when I was there along that border I didn't see or hear anything about Chinese troops but people did tell me they conduct exercises um, with the uh, Tajiks on that border. Um, I've seen in international media that there are bases there but I don't know how true that is or they're interested in building bases. Um, so the thing to know about Tajikistan is that it's not the top of the list when it comes to international investment. It's quite a way down the, the bottom, um, which makes it the perfect place, I think, for Chinese companies to escape overcrowded markets at home. It provides easy pickings because fewer people are interested. Um, and the Tajik government seems to have fully embraced this dependence, as far as I can tell. Um, it's very authoritarian, and there's a strict taboo on bashing China. Um, you can get arrested for asking the wrong questions about China, so it's hard to get a reading on what people think. Uh, but generally I felt that people weren't as hostile as elsewhere, although this is of course could be because they don't want to say. Um, Tajikistan is also tremendously corrupt. There's a lot of wealth captured at the top by President Rahman and his family. And obviously Chinese investment is fueling this. Um, does Dushanbe need a new foreign ministry or a new parliament? Probably not. Is China financing? Yes, of course, because com Chinese companies and equipment is involved. Is Ramon personally profiting? Almost certainly. So, um, the di Tajik director of a Chinese construction company told me that they reckon 95% of investment, this is just a figure they 
picks off the top of their head, but it's interesting. Um, investment lines the pocket of pockets of Ramon and his friends and family. Uh, but then again, the flip side to this is that China is is creating huge number of jobs, like in cement joint ventures, and there aren't many other people in line to invest in these things and create these jobs. So. Uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are the poorest countries in the region. Like Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan is a, a mountainous republic, but it's politically different. Um, it's sometimes called the Switzerland of Central Asia, which I think is a bit off the mark, because governance is very poor here. It's also enormously corrupt, and the democracy isn't particularly functional. Uh, unlike Switzerland, it's had two revolutions in the first decade of the 21st century and the former prime minister is up for murder charges after a shootout at his estate. Mm -hmm. um, but the media is does operate fairly freely and it feels very free there. You go to Bishkek and uh, you notice people are quite happy to uh, talk about politics and to complain about the government especially. They like doing that. Um, so the government has to be more responsive, I think. And by and large, there's a, a lot of um, wariness of China, almost, I'd say, hatred of China. Um, and the government, despite becoming more and more financially dependent, seems very undecided as to whether they should throw their lot in with China, like uh, Romanos. Um, so in Kyrgyzstan, mainly infrastructure, <coughs> Bishkek power plant, which failed during winter time, leaving people, many people without, uh, without heating. Uh, which really tarnished China's reputation. It also um, was associated with corruption that ended up in the arrest of not one, but four, two former prime ministers. Uh, there's also a big transmission line, uh, road project, uh, which is in the bottom right, um, which I think is a good good project. It's again, China Road and Bridge Corporation, which I think is actually quite, quite a good company, and they do some good projects. And then other than that, there's lots of gold mining, small small gold mining, uh, there's a refinery which is here um, and some other mineral processing <coughs> and lastly uh, Kazakhstan uh, which is a very big country land wise and not so big population wise and they've uh, sort of used their oil wealth to get ahead in development terms especially or at least in urban areas and China by the way, owns I think about a quarter of the oil and gas sector, so it's this is where it's most financially at least uh, involved. Um, but Kazakhstan is also the world's largest landlocked country, so logistics is a huge challenge, and they seem quite keen to have Chinese finance uh, <coughs> in infrastructure. There's also quite a lot of Chinese interest in agriculture, other industry. Uh, China and Kazakhstan have this list of 55 uh, projects valued at 24 billion. Um, which are under this uh, international capacity cooperation framework, which is another interesting uh, policy, but we don't have time to look at it now. <coughs> Korgos is one of the more famous uh, BRI projects. Um, so if you've read about BRI, you've probably heard of Korgos or Korgos. <coughs> it's billed as a sort of transnational hub that's rising from the dust in remote desert area and uh, sort of seen as embodying this transcontinental kind of Silk Road spirit. But the reality is a little more nuanced. So when we talk about Korgos, we're talking about two... So I'm just going to throw... Yeah, we're talking about two um, projects. There's this uh, MCPS, this ICBC International Free Trade Zone, visa-free area between China and Kazakhstan which is the top two images, oh, well, all three of them actually, apart from this one in the bottom left. Um, um, and it's largely a depot for cheap Chinese goods. You see people crowding to get in there. It's the only time on the trip that I was almost punched in the face because people almost literally riot to get in there to buy the, buy the bedding and sell it back in, um, uh, back in Kazakhstan. Um, and the Kazakh side is very um, isn't isn't so developed. It's coming along more slowly, so it's not quite as it's imagined in in media, I don't think. And then the other project is the Korgos Gateway, um, which is actually one of two dry ports on that border. Uh, the northern one is actually bigger for now. The small, this one is growing faster, um, but it's not actually the biggest. Uh, and it's a Kazakh initiative. It's a Kazakh project. Um, 
which uh, two Chinese companies actually have a 49% stake in. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, it's a little bit different to um, the story you might read about, I found at least. Um, so yeah, the government in Kazakhstan is is pretty pro-Beijing, pro-Belt and Road, um, a lot of um, friendly rhetoric on that. Um, but the um, people in Kazakhstan have found less so. And so this is uh, one of the general takeaways um, and something quite important when you're talking about Central Asia. Um, is just that despite good government to government relations the public sentiment is largely very negative there's loads of public disturbances in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan which are fueled by anti-Chinese sentiment um, <clears throat> so first off a lot of this is just racism uh, you ask people what do you think about China and they sort of say oh they eat everything and you know just sort of typical casual racism um, uh, there is also a lot of historical animosity between um, the Turkic tribes and the Chinese Empire. You know, this goes way back. I put this picture up there just because this is um, in Kyrgyzstan, um, and this guy with the Kyrgyz traditional hat. He's a Manas teller, and uh, so his job is to recite the Epic of Manas which is the sort of foundational text of Kyrgyz national identity and it deals largely with uh, fighting the Chinese the sort of the principal enemy in it um, and so this was encouraged I think by Soviet propaganda after Sino-Soviet split um, there's this idea that Central Asia is very sort of sparsely populated the Chinese uh, many of them they're gonna come over the border in hordes steal jobs uh, steal lands, take take Kyrgyz and Kazakh women, and there's lots of protests um, about. Well, the big protest was about changes to the land law. Um, uh, so there's also this very big cultural gulf between Central Asia and Han Chinese culture. I think China is perceived as very alien, and obviously this isn't necessarily Beijing's fault. Um, but I think it could also do more to improve its image. Um, in the region. I was told in Kyrgyzstan that Chinese companies have a reputation for turning up and just building things without really consulting local populations. Uh, they also have a reputation for poor environmental standards. I don't know how fair this is but I was told by uh, this one guy who worked for a Chinese gold mining company and had also worked for European and Canadian companies before um, that they all behave very 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 badly when they can get away with it because of lack of governance but he thought the Chinese were the worst of a bad bunch um, so Central Asia is still overwhelmingly uh, Russian in terms of cultural influence and the Chinese soft power efforts seem to me a little bit clumsy there's this uh, Xinhua bookstore in Bishkek which sort of um, does the typical things of offers calligraphy courses and sells books sells <coughs> editions of Xi Jinping's on governance and I can't really see it taking off and then across the road you have this um, Jica sponsored store which sells sort of cute Japanese things made with sort of Kyrgyz handicraft and it's a little bit more sophisticated approach um, but having said that lots of young people are learning Chinese and when you speak to some of them they really do consider China the future they sort of you ask them why, why are you learning Chinese and they say because of US decline and China will be the next superpower um, and people still want to go to Europe and the US when they're talking about um, um, going abroad but I think China is becoming this sort of newer slightly more accessible cheaper option for a lot of people that still provides more op opportunity in terms of education and uh, work than at home so it could change dramatically in time Although I find it personally hard to see Beijing overcoming a lot of the resentment. And then, of course, a very real uh, cause of this resentment, I think, is Beijing's handling of Xinjiang. And I don't know what the conversation's like in India, but in, in Europe, I think we tend to overestimate uh, pan turkic solidarity and the sort of Muslim solidarity. And in reality, I found when I spoke to a lot of people in Kazakhstan that they actually didn't very much like the Uyghurs. And, um, they don't hate them as much as they hate the Chinese, but they see them as troublemakers who sort of deserve what's coming to them almost. Some people, not all of them. Um, but, and this is a big but, people do mention it in conversation as a reason they distrust uh, Beijing. And so I think it, for a lot of people they find it sort of shows them the true character of the regime. They reason that if this is how Beijing uh, behaves with inside the borders, this is potentially how it might behave outside when it has more control.
Uh, and so I've been to Xinjiang three times, twice on this trip. So I won't go into it now, but uh, feel free to ask me about that. Um, so just to finish up, um, how Beijing manages xenophobia amongst its neighbors, I think, is a real challenge. Uh, also Vietnam, places like that, where government-to-government -government relations aren't quite the same as sort of public sentiment. And of course, um, I think this might be fairly typical for relations between small bindling powers and giant neighbors. Um, but as you get further out from China, as I mentioned, um, sometimes China becomes more popular, as in Southeast Europe. Um, and this is partly how new Beijing is in the region. It comes, unlike the EU and Russia, with little historical baggage and sort of serves as this <coughs> kind of neutral foil to already unpopular familiar powers in the region. And I suppose you see this everywhere. Um, something I've noticed, this may be a very sort of rookie uh, geopolitics observation, uh, but when you're talking about attitudes towards China, uh, I've been struck by how much it is defined uh, by the regional balance and um, regional dynamics. In, um, in uh, Belarus and Ukraine, China is seen largely as a more benign counterbalance to Russia, um, whereas in Central Asia, I suppose, uh, cultural affinity with Russia and proximity to China dictates that uh, Beijing is the larger threat. Um, oh, I just noted down something a uh, Ukrainian academic told me uh, I found quite interesting when talking about Russia versus China and he said that he'd go with China any day of the week because uh, he thinks it's in Beijing's fundamental interest to foster stability whereas Moscow wants to promote chaos um, which I thought was a nice contrast just about Belarus well just about Ukraine I mean um, and then another example, uh, closer to home, I guess, uh, which is where the picture is from. This is the Pada Bridge uh, in Bangladesh. And so I'm not going to talk to you about Bangladesh, India, China relations, because I'm pretty sure you know a lot more about that than I do. But I just wanted to share that I was quite surprised when I went to Dhaka and spoke to people how much uh, China-Bangladesh relations were fueled by this wariness of India, especially amongst the military. And um, yeah, this was, this was quite interesting to me. Um, oh no, there is one more slide, sorry. Okay, five minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this intention, uh, my intention with this sort of step through Southeast Europe and Central Asia <clears throat> has been to demonstrate the diversity of how Chinese economic power and the BRI manifests in different contexts. There's uh, lots of variation and not much uniformity. So if I can come up with a headline takeaway, it's that I don't really have a headline takeaway. Um, BRI is not, as I see it, a concrete route running from A to B. It's a lot more messy on the ground. And at a higher conceptual level, it's also very different to how people talk about it as a master stratagem. Um, and I think a lot of people will perceive of BRI in overly concrete terms. They see the Silk Road economic belt as an actual route running east to west. They see it in their mind's eye as this red line that goes from Iwu to London. And um, this is a very spatial conception that Beijing encourages, I think, and one that international media runs with because people like maps. And it's easier to imagine this mess of initiatives and projects as a concrete route. And of course, by this doing this trip, I'm uh, buying into this narrative myself, but I don't think it's wholly accurate. Uh, for a start, connectivity is more complex. So the Europe-China Express uh, routes, uh, which is the Chinese branding for the EU-China rail freight, for example, uh, each week it seems that there's a new EWU London connection, Milan, Chengdu, uh, but all these routes obviously existed long ago and they weren't necessarily built by China. Uh, all that's happening is new subsidized services are running between them. Um, and, but the bigger point is that the BRI activity, I don't think, is much guided by forging connective corridors. Um, obviously, there are big exceptions to this. I think the Yunnan Myanmar one is maybe one where strategic concerns take priority. But generally, I think it ranks behind something like uh, Asian Development Bank's carrot corridors in terms of truly being driven by forging connective corridors. That's vague too, connecting sort of growth poles of Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia and Europe. But I, at least it has a, some sort of a project pipeline and uh, an assessment of what's contributing to connectivity. But with BRI, um, there isn't a project pipeline that I'm aware of, and 
as far as I know, I guess there might be. I don't think there's anyone in Zhongnanhai sort of sitting together and coming up with a list of roads which will help connect the EU and China. Um, so all the infrastructures that I've mentioned, I think almost without exception, uh, there might be one or two, are local initiatives. So these are often decades old ideas uh, which are picked up at um, government to government level, either local governments looking, <coughs> looking for finance for these projects um, or Beijing and Chinese policy banks looking for things to finance to sort of fulfill quotas. And then I guess it's a selection process, is a negotiation between policy banks and companies and local and Chinese uh, politicians. Uh, but the point is that BRI isn't really rolled out on the ground, uh, guided by these big geostrategic ideas, at least um, in my experience of the Silk Road Economic Belt. It's more about nodes and individual projects which are driven by the uh, guiding policy goals that I, I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I think that's it. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got. But I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just would like to say... <laughs> Uh, I haven't had much time to prepare for a real grilling, so uh, go easy in terms of <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Badr, for a, for a fascinating sort of trip through all these areas from South West, uh, Southeastern Europe, all the way to Central Asia, and then uh, even a few um, slides, uh, one slide on the Bangladesh thing, which is also probably which might excite some questions. I think we might get straight away to questions. Younger generation? Younger generation, yes. Mm. Well, younger generation, come up with your questions or with, uh, with observations based on, yeah, on the... One go there. ahead, come. Yeah, uh, I mean, I just have to ask you like one very simple question. Uh, do you know about the Blue Dot uh, Network? The Blue Dot Network? Yes, the Blue Dot Network. Or the Eurasia initiative of South Korea is like, how do you see it as an op opponent to the BRI? Like, very simple question. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard of it, uh, but I haven't sort of looked at it closely, to be honest. Uh, in terms of opposing the BRI, I think it just um, comes down to practical concerns if you're looking at individual projects. I think any country and most countries and most situations are willing to entertain uh, other possible options in terms of finance. So if it's attractive and is willing to uh, displace the Chinese offer in terms of being more competitive, then I think it's uh, possible. Well, but I haven't looked in detail. Um, would you, have any, system, would you have any comments to make on that? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I just wanted to know how the BRI is affecting in the Pacific and mm -hmm. that's why like, you know, the Blue Dot Network or the Eurasia Initiative, like, you know, comes into a little bit into like concern, but that's all. Like, is I just the, wanted to know from the, the Blue Dot Network, is that the sort of rating system? No, 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 no. It's, the, uh, mm -hmm. it's a supplement uh, which has been created by, by Australia, Japan and uh, the US yeah. and India to like yeah. sort of like oppose the BRI, but not really, India, right? it, it uh, even has the cause, the Indo-Pacific. Yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> well, please, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really, um, thank you so much for this, uh, I mean, really a trip, it was a trip. Uh, so, um, I am curious about the uh, fact that you mentioned that because in Kazakhstan they learn Chinese language because they perceive it as China to be the future and, you know, the next superpower. Mm. So, I am really curious about the other countries in Asia, whether, uh, and also Europe, is there any difference in Europe? Are they, are they not looking at Chinese language? I mean, uh, is China promoting Chinese language uh, there in Europe also? or? Uh, is it more these these countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan? I noticed it more in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and again, I guess that must be the proximity um, thing. Um, and I suppose it's a lot easier for Serbians and Montenegrins to go to Europe than it is to China. So I suppose it's a question of options. But China's doing a lot in certainly in Serbia, the Confucius Institutes. I don't know how many there are, but there are quite a few. And you do get a lot of enthusiastic young students uh, saying a similar line about China as the future, in, in Serbia at least, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you already mentioned it in passing. Uh, could you elaborate a little more about 
the Russian influence in Central Asia uh, in terms of a bit louder. the Russian influence in Central Asia, where the, where the government as well as the people you met you know, just doing the day-to-day -day activities, say Russian soft power and the opinions people had about Russians, etc. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I didn't elaborate on it too much because it's not something I uh, know a huge amount about. But uh, in day-to-day, -day, um, I mean, the Russian cultural influence in Central Asia I found huge and very surprising to me. I wasn't expecting it to be quite so strong. I mean, in the cities, everybody speaks Russian. Um, yeah, in Bishkek, in Kyrgyzstan, and in Almaty, in Sultan, in uh, Kazakhstan, Russian is a sort of more common language to hear and to speak than um, Kyrgyz and Kazakh. So that linguistic hold is huge. And uh, just culturally, I mean, the food in restaurants, Russian, um, so many people go to Russia. Uh, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but there's a remittances are a huge part of the economies of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, something huge like a third or a quarter of GDP, but don't quote me on that. Um, so you have lots of people living in Moscow, St. Petersburg, so it's a very, very important part of people's lives. Everyone, everyone, absolutely everyone knows someone who's living in Russia and working in Russia. Um, when they go there, I think sometimes they experience a lot of racism um, from Russians, which sort of taints their feelings towards Russia somewhat, but it's very much the big brother still. Um, yeah, I have that. <laughs> Thanks. It's interesting because it's a generationally different view, isn't it? Because, I mean, for some people from an earlier generation, yeah. it wouldn't seem surprising because that was part yeah, of the Soviet yeah, Union. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, it's interesting that you make that kind of... Because yeah. it, is the, it is the view now, because obviously the current generation will be looking at it exactly like you're looking mm. at it, even inside those countries. Mm. So it's a very interesting change in, yeah, the, in, the, in the perspective. Thing. Because if you were asked me, I'd say, well, you know, obviously it would be Russian because everything they did was in Russian till yeah. the end of the at the end of the eighties, yes, and then of course things changed, but uh, and perhaps there is still some of these vestigial linkages. But I, it's interesting that most of them don't look at it quite that way. You know? Sorry, mm. no, no, that's true. Yeah. Hi, I'm not sure if I came in a little late, so I'm not sure if you already talked about it. But could you uh, el elaborate on uh, on concerns of, say, Chinese investment, concerns of, say, using local labor, local resources, mm. and also uh, rhetoric on quality of infrastructure, etc. And mm -hmm. you also briefly mentioned how there was like a JICA st store there. And mm. So could you also, did you see, uh, could you comment on Japanese investment in this area, and did you see a contrast? Um, thank you. Um, so JICA, um, I just mentioned that in passing to sort of contrast the soft power approaches. Uh, but I need to do more research on what Japan's doing. To be honest, I'm going back there this year, and that's one of my to do on my to do list. I didn't actually. I spoke to people from ADB, from EBRD. Um, but I didn't actually speak to anyone from JICA while I was in Central Asia. I found them quite hard to get hold of. Um, uh, but in terms of quality of Chinese infrastructure and companies, I think it does just vary dramatically uh, depending on the company. I mean, still in lots of these places, China has a reputation uh, for poor quality and cheap products still. I think that is changing in places. Uh, already in Southeast Europe, I mean, you're getting Huawei phones and other products which are uh, perceived to be better quality. But generally, um, generally, that's slowly changing. But it's still the case that China is associated with uh, cheap, low quality, whereas Japan is associated with um, high quality, especially in Vietnam. Um, but the actual truth of the quality, I think, just does depend a lot on the company. Like companies I mentioned, China Road and Bridge Corporation, they seem to be doing some really good work and they have a uh, very good reputation amongst um, uh, policy makers. Um, Sino Hydro, the other company doing those two roads, I don't know if you saw in Macedonia, uh, they're not very good. Um, 
TBEA, uh, the company responsible for that power plant in Bishkek, they're not very good, at least when it comes to power plants. So it's just very varied. Um, but I think that's what BRI is partly about. It's about improving the quality of these companies um, by tying loans to contracts. They can sort of break past that perception of bad quality. So people are going to hire Chinese companies even if they think they're bad quality because it's so cheap and because they get a ready, ready-made loan attached to it. So it's all one convenient package that doesn't take up much uh, capacity. Um, so I think uh, the BRI is trying to change that perception. And uh, then local labor is interesting. Uh, just in terms of what I saw, and I didn't go on any sort of orchestrated visits, so this is just what I saw in terms of taking a taxi and turning up. Uh, in Central Asia, it was mostly local labor. Um, obviously, I can't comment on different regions, but Central Asia, local labor. Um, most of the Chinese are in managerial positions and more higher skilled uh, jobs. Um, people at CRBC uh, told me um, that so basically lots of these countries have quotas in place and they've been steadily raising them. Um, I can't remember what it is exactly in, t- in Kyrgyzstan, like 70-30 or some requirement of local labour use and apparently uh, CRBC isn't following these recommendations, I mean they're not recommendations, these rules, because local governance isn't so great they can quite easily uh, pay a bit of money and get around them. Um, but yeah, generally Chinese are still in managerial positions and it does seem to be mostly the low skilled labour is local. Uh, Southeast Europe, um, mostly uh, there's quite a lot of Chinese labour being used. Oh, one more thing to mention actually, that I was told by uh, Kyrgyz managers, um, so in companies, is that they tried hiring uh, local labour, and I, again, not passing judgment on whether this is true, but this is what they told me. They tried hiring local labour, but they just, they just weren't very productive. And this Kyrgyz guy was saying, oh, it's because the Kyrgyz are lazy and they can't do a good job, so if we want to build this in record time, we just need to use uh, Chinese, Chinese labour. Uh, so you hear that quite a lot, actually. It's from local people. Obviously, local people play, paid by Chinese companies. Um, uh, that's um, the reason Chinese labour is used is because uh, it's the best way to get these roads built. So, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, and then. Yeah. So, just one follow-up question. You talked about you know the CRBC China role and uh, the big corporation and uh, China National Petroleum and a lot of companies. These are state-owned companies, right? Yeah, yeah, those so two. So, I want to know about you know uh, the Chinese private companies whether they are in investing in PR, especially the Silk Road, yeah. uh, the Central Asia Silk Road initiative. Uh, so, could you elaborate more on the private sector participation in the BRI projects? Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. I think I think there is a lot of private investment. Uh, it's it was difficult for me to notice, I guess, because it's generally smaller scale, um, but it does exist uh, in Tajikistan. Um, I spent some time with the uh, Jongtai group, which. I can't remember actually whether they're state-owned uh, at the moment. I think they're not. I think they might be private. Anyone know? Jongtai? I heard of them? Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm going to assume that's private, um, in case, uh, unless anyone corrects me. Um, but yeah, in Tajikistan, like I mentioned, it's actually um, a very good environment for uh, Chinese investors uh, who are willing to take a little bit of risk and um, find sort of... Um, potential projects and joint ventures in things like cement and cotton because there's lots of opportunity in Tajikistan. Um, They don't have the capital or the technology to uh, sort of utilize uh, the resources and China has the capital and technology. Uh, It just needs, I guess, the market and also space because the few, I did speak to a couple of private uh, companies in Tajikistan and they both said they were just there because um, they couldn't find space to invest in China itself so they saw sort of Tajikistan as this blank canvas um, where they could find opportunities for growth so that doesn't really answer your question um, because I haven't sort of 
I haven't got any facts or figures, but in my sort of impressionistic understanding, um, private companies are quite involved in smaller scale FDI in Central Asia, uh, but less so with the big infrastructure projects. Just a minute after I read this. Uh, <coughs> one uh, question really, uh, uh, the impression that we uh, got from your presentation is that is that rather than a central policy driving these projects in different parts of Europe and Central Asia, it is essentially, uh, you know, aggregate of individual projects given by the Chinese companies, etc., etc. Now, who are the partners for these projects on the recipient side? Are these governments or private companies? I would assume that these could be mostly governments, really, if these are infrastructure. But uh, if these are governments, clearly the partners on the Chinese side would have the blessing or would have the approval of the Chinese government, I, I assume. A second question linked to that is the funding, the investment. Uh, what is the share of investment from Chinese in these projects? And where is that investment coming from? This cannot be purely private company investment. They must be getting the money from either the China Development Bank or AIB or so on, somewhere. And if it is coming from there, that's actually another route for getting the Chinese government approval before they can be invested. So it would seem to me that there would be actually somewhere a control or basically a, a Control. Uh, let us say uh, some handle from the, uh, the central government somewhere there in through the financial route. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. This is true. So on share of investments. Uh, so if you're talking about the the, um, uh, the infrastructure projects, yeah, you're right. That does come from the Chinese Import policy control. banks. Yeah. I've just got a slide right at the beginning which I didn't use. Um, so yeah, this is e Export Impact Bank, Import Bank Impact of China Bank. and China Development Bank. Right. Well, basically the only two. I just put AIB in the other. Yeah. Oh, it's off. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's all Exim Bank and CDB basically. Um, and yeah, I assume this requires uh, some sort of blessing. Um, the impression I got, and again, I'm not an expert in um, the domestic processes at work. Uh, but the impression I got from speaking to a few people at CRBC was that a lot of this is uh, negotiation between people at CRBC and Exim Bank without necessarily rerouting through Beijing. Um, and at least CRBC, the case of the um, road in Kyrgyzstan, I got the impression from speaking to the manager of that project that there wasn't much support even from the Chinese government, which I found very surprising. They didn't um, talk about it. No, that's true. But my, it was a sort of strong, we we're having an mm. off the record sort of fairly frank uh, discussion. And he was talking about corruption and other stuff like that, sort of openly. He was a, he was a young guy, which mm. was quite interesting. He was like this uh, maybe sort of early 30s. And a lot of these projects, this is sort of a side point, mm. uh, these uh, mm. sort of new breed of uh, Chinese uh, uh, managers who seem a lot more open to talk to media mm. um, um, but yeah he sort of gave the impression that there wasn't a huge amount of support from the state but obviously there is his blessing uh, but I guess my, my, my main point with this uh, the idea that it's an aggregate of individual projects was that the drivers the projects themselves the infrastructure projects themselves were a local initiatives. So obviously there are uh, strategic and other concerns in terms of picking them from a list. So I'd imagine that there's a list of... Uh, actually, so it's, this is a good example. In Bangladesh, um, I was speaking to the chairman of um, the Pi Report project, uh, who was saying he was expecting Chinese financing for that project. Uh, and he sort of applied, I can't remember what it's called, but the relevant uh, Bangladeshi uh, body ministry for uh, Chinese financial support. And they told him that he had to get behind a list of 27 that they were already seeking approval for. Um, so 
and I would imagine that the main concerns when the China, when Exim Bank comes to picking from that list would be commercial. Uh, is my impression, combined with the balance of sort of strategic and commercial concerns, and then negotiations with the companies that are going to be put forward for this. So they pick the projects from a list of um, local initiatives, um, and then decide put forward a variety of Chinese companies that are then uh, selected in the tendering process. Um, but yeah, sorry, to get back to your main question, my point was that these initiatives come from the local side, and yeah, there's government selection on the Chinese side. Well, we know that then next after this one. Um, obviously, I mean, first of all, thank you very much. This is very interesting indeed and very educative. Uh, and I presume because of um, brevity of time, you were only on belt and not on the road side, other than Bangladesh, perhaps Chittagong, etc., one might say, part of the road thing. Now, I, I have this, sort of, I don't know how many, this is in some ways a um, continuation of what my friend Suresh Goyal was saying. Um, did you have an opportunity to compare pre-BRI and post-BRI situation? Specifically, has BRI meant that the various recipient countries are getting better terms now than they did in the pre-BRI terms? Is there, say, a larger grant element? Are loans coming at better terms? Is there anything for them to gain except the name BRI? Which, of course, is something to the greater glory of Xi Jinping. Mm. Um, I haven't done the pre-BRI and post-BRI comparison, unfortunately. It's something I probably should do. Um, I don't know whether the terms are any better. I don't know whether there was an improvement of terms. I would imagine that the availability of finance, I don't think uh, before BRI, before this general push, uh, Exim Bank was an option for Montenegro or Serbia. Um, I think it's only post-BRI that China's looking at these countries and um, offering its financing. So I don't know whether the terms have changed of the loans, uh, but just that availability of capital, I think, is the difference between the pre and post uh, situation. Um, interestingly, I think the, the terms have actually gotten worse more recently in the last couple of years. They have got worse? Yeah, a couple of people, so this is just anecdotal. That's another point of differentiation. differentiation, if I may just modify, between the second forum and the first forum, the April yeah. 2019 yeah. has that actually been my another, question. another point of, of, of uh, departure mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Has there been any, did you notice anything like that? Just a couple of people said that it's the terms have gotten a little worse for Chinese loans, just in the sense was that they had the, the Chinese were less eager to loan um, and were more careful in considering uh, projects more selection process. So I think that is starting to happen. Um, with the projects I looked at, it was obviously too late. These are all projects underway where the financing has already been agreed. But I would imagine, my guess, with new projects um, that the policy banks are going to take a longer look and a more careful look. Yeah, yeah. You are you? sorry, please go on. It's all right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my basic question is that don't you feel that the uh, uh, economic model of this you know BRI is completely broken you know unlike these world bank projects you know which are properly studied you know this one is completely a fantasy land you know we are already seeing tensions with the CPEC you know even in the Sri Lanka there was this Amban uh, you know uh, 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 problem issue you know with that even in Europe you know a lot of this is you know uh, uh, and a lot of these countries don't have very strong you know fiscal policy you know and lot of the, these and so this is going to lead to a you know lot more of a political crisis as well as economic crisis and you know a lot of these Ch Chinese allies are going to distance you That's know from it. so the point is that unlike this Marshall plan in the second world war and world, world bank report projects you know this is completely not at all a well thought of uh, process you know so don't you feel that will lead to a slowdown as far as the China economy and the global economy is concerned you know? um, I think I think the um, viability of these projects just depends project to projects and country to country. I think the main thing is uh, uh, local governance and oversight. I think countries like Serbia are potentially better equipped to handle 
uh, dealing with uh, Chinese financing in countries like Montenegro, which are so much smaller. So they've got to pull the national body of bureaucrats and politicians from a population of 700,000 people, uh, whereas Serbia was sort of left with all that, all that after the breakup of uh, Yugoslavia and they, my impression is that they have a lot more capacity to um, negotiate uh, and in terms of debt traps and stuff I guess it, I, again it depends on the individual situation of uh, the country I, I don't think it's, it's uh, a widespread debt crisis for a lot of countries um, I haven't been to Sri Lanka yet but I plan to go Thank you very much. Excuse me, I have to go to another meeting. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I have another thing to go to. Thank you. I don't see. Uh, you know, I, th I think uh, the point you made about uh, management of sinophobia, how, be how Beijing manages sinophobia, it's very interesting because essentially what you've painted is whether it's in South East Europe whether it's in Central Asia or even, as you said, very, very marginally, you've dealt with South Asia. The question is the country's concerned, the party's concerned, the corporations, local corporations concerned are looking for a viable good deal. Mm. And in the absence, in the, in the sense of the, the, their experience of some of the existing deals, this seems better and therefore they're trying to look at it. They have certain preconceptions and they have certain perhaps certain complexes vis-a-vis -vis existing relationships, whether it's with the EU mm. or whether it's the Soviet Union and the Ru Russians or in this case in the subcontinental context also. And they are looking for how to, in a sense, negotiate the best deal that they can. Yeah. Is that an overall kind of, could you say that that in, in a sense clear-eyed without, without falling into any of, any of these uh, in the rhetoric of the BRI and at the same time trying to get the maximal deal? that they can in the circumstances. Add to that, of course, there are layers of corruption. Mm -hmm. Obviously, leaders, you know, leaders having deals and in some ways, uh, the, the Chinese corporations having deals, working out certain, you know, the, uh, things which may not work to the, to, the de to, the, to the advantage of the local corporations or the local uh, authorities. They have to be then finessed as can be best finessed in the particular mm. circumstances, but all working within a certain parameter of trying to negotiate what is perhaps the best in the circumstances. Mm. Now here, there is, I think, uh, in fact, I would like your comment on this. There is a difference between the BRI, which was in a sense, the summing up of all the, the projects, etc., that had been done in the past which had tried to reflect the requirements of the past in individual areas and they came into projects and then they became part of the the first BRI in the, in the, the, after the first forum which of course was in, was in a sense had much of the the kind of uh, absence of of direction absence of organization and just a cluster of a mix or a kind of a, a grab a bag of all kinds of projects the impression one gets, I mean, we'd like to, I'd like to have your view on it, is that since the second forum, there's a lot, much greater degree of organization, systematization, reflection of sentiment gathered in the, in terms of public attitudes and, and criticisms, etc. And also certain standards which are externally laid. It, like, for example, you were saying what, what has happened in Europe when EU has been making certain comments, making certain, uh, asking certain governments to, to adhere to certain standards, etc. I think this is a problem which the Chinese corporates themselves are actually facing and mm. seeking to address as they get into a greater systematization of the BRI mm. in the process of making this a lot more, you know, a coherent uh, kind of a, a project which meets both their their ideological dreams, etc., but also, in a sense, uh, in a sense, seeks to subserve the interests of China Inc., mm. of, of, of you know, of the of the larger corporate sectors and uh, public sector organizations of China. How do you reflect on mm. this? Yeah, that's um, <coughs> that's a good question because 
I think um, really a question I should be pursuing is can they manage this? Yeah. And that's sort of Which something I want to ask this year um, back when I go to Central Asia. Um, and that's obviously, like you said, the, the idea. And that's they've declared that. And I fully believe that's Beijing's intent to sort of systematize and uh, mm. be better yeah, in these be. regards. Um, but I just uh, I, I, I question how possible this is. Uh, without moving too far away from the existing model, which, like you said, services the needs of China Inc. So if it starts turning down projects like the Montenegro Highway because mm -hmm. they're not commercially viable, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Um, how far does it go before it just becomes another sort of traditional uh, financier like the World Bank? Right. I mean, you have the... Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which uh, so he seems to me like the sort of lean, well, they say lean, clean, green, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But that's the lean, clean, green face of the Belt and Road. That's a financial institution that only co-finances projects, sort of focuses on environmentally um, sound projects and such. Um, I think if the BRI generally, if the two policy banks move towards only financing projects in the manner that the AIIB does. I think there aren't going to be many projects to finance because I think almost a defining thing about the Chinese development model is that it gives rein to local governments to um, build what they want to build to some extent, like, uh, like the roads and like the power plants. That's almost the defining thing about the BRI to me. Um, and obviously I guess we have to remember that the SOEs, they're big powerful actors in their own regard, so whether Beijing can rein them in, um, how it overcomes that um, their own motivation to keep growing, and whether Beijing can sort of make the necessary sacrifices, mm -hmm. uh, which may come with jobs, or yeah. I don't know, I just, I, 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 no, I it's don't an to be convinced. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make, because the same kind of economic logic that has prevented these big infrastructure projects from actually being undertaken by the Western uh, financing agencies, public intergovernmental financing agencies, will naturally be faced by the Chinese. Yeah. The reason why they take it is perhaps this additional, the China model, if you will. To, but the, Ch the Chinese model is not based on a different logic. It has to work within the same logic. The only difference is that whereas the international uh, intergovernmental financing agencies, etc., may look at individual projects and say, no, this is not viable, etc., the Belt and Road looks at interlinkages between these various projects, which are part of the large sort of project, pro project process, the direction they have, and then work out a logic to try and cross subsidize in some way internally in their own in their own minds if it were and then build a logic for that is the only only logic that one can see mm -hmm. and if that is the case then of course there is a process there is a direction of course we probably are not able to see it in individual cases but i think there is and that's probably th the reason why they have even taken this of course there is the it is quite possible to suggest that many of these have been taken initially just as a response to possibly its corruption. It's probably the leaders working some kind of a, mm -hmm. that could be the case. But even there, I think that th there has to be some way in which these eventually will be, the dots will be filled up. Mm. <coughs> I, I mean, I, I think I just remain to be convinced about the dots, about the dots. being connected up. Like I said, I think this is probably a very different case in Myanmar and places that I haven't been to. But in if I just take all of the transport infrastructure projects that I see being financed by Chinese policy banks in, in on this Silk Road Silk economic road. bill, they don't add up. They don't add up. Uh, I mean, you just literally sort of draw them on a map. There's North South in Montenegro, and they're sort of like mm -hmm. they don't. I mean, but in the sense, they all add up because they're all enhancing connectivity, and these corridors are so broadly defined that if you're enhancing connectivity in Serbia full stop that's working towards the larger strategic objectives of the BRI mm -hmm. um, but I don't really believe you don't think the Macedonia connection with Belgrade is going to 
that's part of the it's it's to connect with Serbia isn't it with the border of Serbia with um, the the, part. with Greece the yes. Adriatic yes. port going out to north yeah well that's uh, okay uh, one sorry not best for the Tunagora one the Montenegro one no. yeah um, but you mean from the the one you said is absolutely oh, out oh, of right. mm -hmm. yeah yeah I mean I, in a sense that it enhances connectivity in the region in with the region. BRI yeah. but I mean I, I guess that could apply to any yeah. uh, highway oh, projects that's right. that's um, so yeah, I yes, think yes, please. that maybe the, the <laughs> concept of time may be different. I think what, yes, Chinese, yes, yes, what the time. Chinese are planning or thinking is much different yes, than the yeah. normal international agencies planning. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, what you call patient capital. What somebody yeah. called patient capital, waiting, mm -hmm. you know, waiting over the long run, deep pockets waiting longer. Yeah. But again, that I think he questions that also, which is a very interesting point to make. But that's the normal argument which mm -hmm. is made. Go ahead, Ashok, and then you. Yes. No, One, Mm -hmm. point which you Mr. alluded to, but I'll request you to dwell on it a little further. Well, you make this point that you know, in different countries, uh, different projects, there are different underlying considerations and drivers. So you did offer in one of your slides a listing of 10 mm. you know, goals, mm. considerations or drivers Chinese have in mind. But uh, do you think there is a unifying uh, link a thread running through all these projects, even though they may be, uh, as you put it, a hodgepodge a collection of projects, you know, a sort of catch all basket of projects. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this unifying uh, thread could be what we just mentioned the strategic considerations uh, underlying them. You know, bottom line being that China is using these projects to promote its mm. influence, to project the centrality of China, its larger neighborhood. Uh, how do you see that? Mm. Mm. You know, they, these projects may be disparate, yet they are somehow linked. Mm. These dots are somehow connected. Mm. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree um, that all of these projects in some way work towards enhancing Chinese influence, yeah. economic, political, diplomatic, and this is what the BRI is, a, is about. It's about uh, capturing that thirst for global capital and turning it into uh, diplomatic, political, uh, diplomatic, um, economic uh, leverage. Um, yeah, so I, I agree, but I, I suppose I just um, would push back on that being a uh, narrow <coughs> enough thing to be a unifying factor. Uh, in, in that sort of gaining influence is such a uh, broad, almost sort of will that states have. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> I don't know how that can be more narrowly defined, but I completely agree that all of these projects, in some way, uh, the uh, the drive driver is um, uh, to gain influence, mm -hmm. whether it's the influence of. Um, companies or um, the influence that comes from sort of indebtedness and dependence uh, or just the influence that comes from um, doing a good job and making people happy uh, by building a nice road. I think the sort of various um, strategies at work but yeah it does come down to influence. Yeah, but again what does <coughs> I suppose is my, um, is my point. Mm. It's quite fascinating the kind of as you can go on this particular we can probably keep our keep getting you know to fine tune this kind of this kind of approach but clearly the Chinese know that in places like Central Asia there is a very strong China China phobia and I don't think the Chinese are unaware of that but nevertheless they see that as central to them moving forward and so they have to build relation build dependencies not necessarily to enhance that phobia but perhaps to in a sense, m ameliorate that or, or at least, you know, counteract that and phobia. And also, you know, certain hardwiring of connectivity. Yeah. That's right. You know, certain well, hardwiring of, of, you know, linkages, yeah. dependencies, mm. Mm. Yeah, which in have their own Interdependencies, logic. which will build up uh, logic eventually. That's what he talks about eventually. And that's, in some ways, he talks about win-win. It's not always win-win, but nevertheless, there is some attempt to build interdependencies and Hmm. make connectivity into a reality of life where actually these will, they, it will be a hard negotiation on both sides, but they will be a realistic, a kind of a 
you know, discussion of how that will meet each other's, uh, you know, but immediate interest as well as long term, longer term interest. Yes, please. Well, if I may just. I think that Sinophobia has also been addressed through the Confucius school, uh, the, the promotion of Chinese language and culture. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've looked at it. Like, I mean, are you, uh, do you think that the language and promoting of Chinese language and culture is also, you know, uh, part of the. I mean, it's like mutual, like helping BRI and BRI would help. Uh, uh, promotion of language and culture, especially culture, also like, and and perhaps addressing the China uh, sinophobia someday that mm -hmm. you know China is not just about whatever historically it, it used to mm -hmm. be, but now there is this rich culture which. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I have been looking at this aspect for some time. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. something which interests me. So I'm coming back to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it is interesting, but uh, I guess I'm just quite cynical about the efforts in Central Asia, just from what I've seen, um, because the, I mean, I love I love China and Chinese culture, and I love being in China, and uh, there are so many aspects of it that appeal to me personally from having 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 lived there and knowing it, and that's why it seems uh, such a failing uh, on Beijing's part in Central Asia, not selling not selling these things. I mean. Um, yeah, that Bishkek yeah, Xinhua bookstore, it is just literally, they have uh, wall to wall Xi Jinping's on governance and that's how they're promoting Chinese culture, <laughs> so it's like, I, I don't see it working <laughs> personally. Um, and you also add to that that, this is true of uh, all uh, sort of immigrants, foreigners, uh, be they sort of Canadian or whatever, to a certain extent living in Central Asia, but the Chinese business people I spoke to um, seemed even more than the usual uh, sort of foreign investor separate from local communities. Like I only met, um, I think, one or two uh, people in, in the region who spoke uh, Russian. Or, or lo I mean, I didn't speak to anyone who spoke Kazakh or Tajik, <laughs> but um, who spoke Russian. Largely, they. I met many people who had been there for like 10, 12 years in sort of they just had their entourage of um, translators and sort of kept quite separate so I, I don't think the best or most effective efforts are being made in mm. my opinion. But, but in Pakistan, Nepal please, and uh, all these yeah. countries I think. Yeah. Oh, please go ahead. Uh, uh, just uh, a thank question. You, thank you Chair. Um, Jacob, have you ever uh, instance come across that the project being refused by the Chinese government? Hmm. Um, not off the top of my head. I have to think about mm -hmm. that more carefully. That's an interesting, interesting one. Right. Um, uh, mm. The project being rejected, you mean, for, for on, on economic or other count? Mm. I can <coughs> vaguely recall various dynamics like that where one project was preferred. There was sort of oh, the yeah. option of several projects within the country put to the Chinese and they would sort of pick one. Um, so in that sense, the alternatives would have been refused, but sorry, I can't recall. I have to get back to you on, on that. <laughs> right. Well, I think if there aren't any, we must, uh, you must call a, uh, this has been a fascinating exercise from the ground, as you said, and interestingly, though you are, you are uh, almost uh, on principle unwilling to generalize because I think it takes a lot, it will take a lot more information on the ground mm -hmm. and analysis of what you've already got mm -hmm. in order to be able to generalize. Clearly, you, we understand that. But it's what, what you are seeing and what you have shown us in terms of what you see on the ground itself is fascinating food for thought for us to understand both the, the complexities of connectivity, as you said, the dependencies that are created by projects be built on Competing perhaps national interests on the one hand, the Chinese interests, local interests, and proclivities on on each side, and how they sort of meet together, and in a sense generate the success or the the pace of these projects, individual projects. And I think this is not going to go away very soon. We're going to see it again and again. And it also is quite clear that the Chinese are not, despite all the complexities of the and the complications created even by most recent events i don't think the bri is going to in a sense mm. the getaway f uh, be you know be forgotten very soon or be abandoned it's going to remain and it is going to perhaps increase in its complexity yes. in the complexity it it, it, it sort of uh, seems to project both for uh, target countries as well as for china and i think
therein perhaps lies the the the, the both the both the i think the promise as well as the problems the the, the potential dilemmas of the bri and uh, it's very difficult to say you know just straight away that uh, this is something that is not going to work or it's going to work mm. it's clear that uh, this is something that that it's going to take a lot of effort on all on all parts to 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 to, to sort of realize and it that some vague form or, or um, any, a kind of a a kind of a a, a different kind of a animal will emerge at the end but we only hope that what emerges is something that adds to <coughs> the the overall connectivity which builds into the, the the sort of system which is there are famous there are also various other options which are coming up whether it's from the from the west whether it's from japan whether it's from countries like india each of these will serve to both help to give target countries more choices also help them increase their negotiating power vis-a-vis -vis the chinese and while no clear alternate vision i mean there are certain you know free and open indo pacific things like that but i don't know whether there's been any this kind of dramatic vision like the bri which is mm. has come in its place so till that happens i think this is going to be predominant this is going to be dominating the landscape for a long time to come mm. thank you very much jacob for your yeah. very very interesting uh, analysis for your uh, for the information that you've given and your it's more the impressions that you have been able to 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 convey to us which is uh, which actually will 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 give us i think some scope for examining mm -hmm. while we each, each one looks at the bri from our perspectives thank you very much thank you, thank you.